this planet and this moon itself um, is very slim. Yeah. <laughs> but where there's one planet, often we find more. So there might be more planets in the system uh, where, you know, could be, that could be rocky. We just haven't had the, um, the sensitivity to detect them yet. So that's something that, you know, we'll see in the future if we're able to tell whether or not there's additional planets in the system that could have ingredients for life. Well, mm -hmm. I guess we'll have to stay tuned. Um, and we're actually starting to take in some of your questions. Keep sending them, and I've got some really good ones here. Um, hashtag Ask NASA, of course. Um, so, Jennifer, we were just talking about the temperature of the moon. What, what is the temperature <laughs> of the moon? Well, again, we don't know too much about this moon yet. Um, we know roughly its size, its mass, it's huge. Um, but we don't really know all these details, but we can kind of estimate. The researchers who, who uh, were detecting this object estimated its temperature based on its distance and likely composition. So we think it's a balmy maybe 80 degrees Fahrenheit up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, warm but not boiling hot. Yes. Perfect for life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Nicole, was this was this a surprise for scientists when we saw this thing? Was it was it shocking, or were we looking for it? What? Well, you know, thinking about our own solar system, where we have a lot of planets and we have a lot of moons around those planets, um, Jupiter and Saturn both have many many planets, or sorry, many moons around them. Um, you know, there's so many moons in our own solar system essentially that finding even just one outside our solar system around another star, around another planet, is not that surprising. Um, it's just, it shows you though, since we've only found one, how difficult it is to find these small signals. And so, you know, I'm sure over time we can find more, um, but who knows if there'll be anything like our own moon, Earth system, you never know. All right, so a few more questions coming in. Um, Jennifer, is it possible to one day find exoplanets that have binary orbits like Pluto or Sh and Charon in that system? Well, um, certainly it's possible. I mean, this is very interesting. Um, if you have, you know, one body orbiting a star and then something perhaps orbiting that body as we do in a moon planet system, but then there can also be sort of binary planet situations. The definition of that is not always completely clear. So it's certainly possible in this system that we might have a binary planetary system. Um, in this case, though, the candidate moon that we have is something like, um, you know, 1.5% the mass of its planet. It's similar to the Earth um, and our moon ratio of mass. The size difference is pronounced between, also between this moon and its planet. And so it's more, um, I think it would be more accurately described if this is confirmed as a moon planet system as opposed to a binary planet system, simply because of that uh, difference in size and mass ratio. But we need a few more observations to, to learn more details. And it's interesting you should say that because the very next question that I got in was how big is the moon? Well, it's, it's large. I mean, we, we think, um, again, we can compare it to something like Neptune in our own solar system. So, uh, you know, we're not used to having moons that are bigger than planet, that much bigger than planet Earth in our own solar system. So it's really hard to compare. This is, you know, think about the Earth-Moon system that we're accustomed to and then expand it. Um, and then you've got this uh, a huge system, a very large Jupiter-like planet with a Neptune-sized moon, both gaseous type bodies um, as the system. So it's uh, much larger than what we're accustomed to, to any type of system in our own solar system. Exciting. Yeah. You know, it's nice to find new things. Um, speaking of which, we had a Facebook follower asking um, if we plan to send a probe to this exo moon. Nicole, what do you think about that? Oh gosh, I mean that would be amazing <laughs> if we could do that. Um, but Jennifer mentioned before how far away it is. Um, it's 8,000 light years away, which means that even if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take 8,000 years to get there. So, you know, it's it would be, you know, one of these 
awesome, nice to have things, but I think it'll be a while before we have the technology to be able to send a probe there, unfortunately. <laughs> we don't have warp drive yet. Yeah, we need warp drive. <laughs> I continue to send in your questions. We're taking them live from social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Um, so the next question that I got was from Facebook, and somebody asked, why should we be limiting the search for life to water slash carbon-based planets? Uh, very good question. <laughs> so, um, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So, so life forms could be very different from the type of life that we are accustomed to on planet Earth. We've all seen a lot of science fiction. But there are some good reasons to think that complex life would probably be carbon-based and probably need some connection to liquid water. That's certainly what we found on planet Earth. And we also are able, at least from our experience here, to recognize what that type of life would do to its atmosphere such that we could detect it from a distance and look at the atmospheric characteristics and know that there must be some kind of biological activity going on. So those are some of the reasons why it makes sense to look for life that has some similar basis to the life forms that we are familiar with on planet Earth. Yeah, makes sense. Um, a lot of questions for Facebook, good one. Um, so how do we measure, how do we go about measuring the size and distance to an exoplanet or an exomoon? Hmm. So the size is um, a it's essentially we're using the same way we used to find it in the first place. <laughs> um, so it's something called the transit method, where basically the um, planet blocks a fraction of the light of the star. And based on how much it blocks, it's kind of like a ratio of areas. Um, so you can say, oh, 1% of light is blocked, which means some object of some specific size had to block that size, um, that amount of light. And so in that, in that way, we're able to measure the radius of the planet. That means we um, also need to know the size of the star in order to compare the two. Um, but we can know that from using uh, observations from even other telescopes as well. So there's like this whole army of telescopes you need to be able to really find the planets and measure their properties and, um, and you know, learn more about them. And in terms of the distance, right, that was the other part of the question. Uh, so how we measure the distance, there was actually um, a uh, mission called Gaia that is recently um, collecting data to measure positions of stars in the sky. And based on measuring the positions of the stars, we actually can measure kind of like this angle of how much they move. And that actually tells us the distance away from Earth. So um, it's it's really, again, an army of telescopes that operates, you know, in concert to provide all this information to get us the size, even mass, you know, distance, everything. So it's a lot of work, but it's it's definitely worth it. <laughs> oh, we're lucky we have a great team. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got another question from hashtag Ask NASA. Um, it is, how much stronger is the gravity on this exomoon compared to then Earth? Well, that's a very good question. I would think <laughs> I would have to sit and calculate that out. <laughs> um, Put you on the spot. Right? Right? Put me on the spot. So um, we know that its mass, uh, uh, they were they asking about the moon or the planet? So um, it, looks, it looks like compared to Earth. How much stronger is the gravity on this X moon compared to Earth? Okay, so this moon is basically larger than Earth, it's basically the size of Neptune, so it's going to have a stronger gravitational field based on the mass difference mm -hmm. between the Moon and the Earth. I can't actually tell you that because we don't know for sure the actual mass of this Moon, but it's going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be an odd thing to imagine because it doesn't have a solid surface. So if you're thinking about, you know, jumping up and down on this Moon like you might do on Earth's Moon if you were an astronaut, um, you're not going to have the same experience. So it's stronger, and that may have actually interesting implications for the layers of atmosphere in this moon. So if we have future telescopes where we can actually measure the composition of the atmosphere of this moon and compare it to, let's say, planets in our own gaseous planets in our own solar system, we may be able to understand something about how that moon has been formed, what its nature is, and how that strong gravitational field is affecting how the layers of 
of uh, gases are arranging themselves in this moon. So I look forward to being able to understand the effects of the gravitational field and maybe even a magnetic field when we have future observations. Yeah. So we're just going to have to wait and see for a lot of these questions. Um, so this is actually a really interesting question. Um, if our own Earth was this far away, would we be able to detect it? So if our Earth was like 8,000 light years away, I guess, at the same distance, um, that's a good question. It, so the initial planet that, that this moon orbits around is a Jupiter-sized planet, which is something like 10, 11, 12 times the size of Earth. So it causes a pretty large dip in light. So the Earth, being that much smaller, would cause a much smaller dip, um, like a tenth of, of what um, that Jupiter causes. So we would basically need, you know, very, very precise instruments. And Kepler did discover um, several Earth-sized exoplanets. Um, but then to have, you know, an exomoon around it, that's something we haven't discovered yet. So, you know, there's, it, it's tricky, <laughs> is, the, is the answer. Um, it depends on a lot of things. Um, but, you know, it's not, um, it's not impossible. You just need to make sure you have the right, you know, telescope, basically. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Continue sending your questions into hashtag Ask NASA, by the way. We will get to as many as we can. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to some after the show, too, I'm sure. Um, so how does the gravity, well, we already discussed gravity. How's the electromagnetic field of that exomoon compared to Earth? Do we, do we even have any information on that yet? Well, that's a, that's a great question because that would impact all kinds of things about the environment, about that exomoon. So we don't have a lot of information about this whole system, but as, as I mentioned earlier, we think that the star that this planet and potential moon are orbiting um, is, a, is not too different from our sun. So it's going to have some of those same characteristics of the sun, which would include magnetic field activity that might, in fact, interact uh, occasionally. The, the, the stellar activity may interact with the planet and its moon, its system, just the same way as our sun has certain activity, flares and so forth, that uh, interact with our Earth-Moon system. And then it's quite possible that this um, planet that this moon is associated with would have a magnetic field. That magnetic field would impact its moon and it would affect the environment there. And that would affect how that system is interacting with flares and particles, cosmic rays coming from its parent star. So we don't know yet what the magnetic field might be around that system. We know it's going to get the same you know, ballpark radiation from its parent star as we get from the sun in our Earth-Moon system. Uh, and this will impact whether there is any sort of habitability in this region uh, at the very least, it'll be very interesting to study. So I'm just, we, we keep talking about future <laughs> telescopes, but I'm, I'm very keen about this direction of astronomy because we are using the telescopes we have, like mm -hmm. Hubble um, and soon TESS, to learn what we can. But future telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope um, are going to be able to give us more details about the nature of this exoplanet system and others mm -hmm and the environments around them and what their moons might be like in terms of their interactions with magnetic fields, with radiation, temperatures, um, all kinds of things. So uh, this is just the beginning of our investigation into this whole type of object. It's a new yeah. science. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is an interesting question, <laughs> and it may be a little bit difficult. Uh, is it possible that this moon could have its own moons? Wow, oh, that is a great question <laughs> and a difficult one. Um, well, first, it, I mean, I'll say anything's possible, you know, as we've been discovering all kinds of exoplanets, first of all, things that we didn't know could exist um, that orbit so close to their star that, you know, they orbit within one day compared to our one year orbit. So things like this that we never even dreamed of. Um, so an, an exomoon having its own moons is possible, especially when. Um, this moon is so massive that maybe it could, what we call, you know, use its gravity to capture other smaller bodies around it. Um, like Mars has two very tiny moons, relatively speaking, compared to our moons. 
So maybe there's some very tiny moons um, that have been captured by this moon and are orbiting, but we just don't have the right instruments to be able to detect them right now. Um, and yeah, but uh, it's definitely uh, possible. So that could be cool. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about Hubble and we've been talking about NASA's anniversary and um, so NASA's been around for 60 years and Hubble's been around for almost half that time. How's our telescope doing? Well, we're excited. Well, as you say, Hubble's been around almost half the time that NASA's been around. And we just celebrated Hubble's 28th birthday um, <laughs> earlier this year. Hubble's been working well because we have this terrific crew of people on the ground that are keeping it uh, uh, strong, scientifically working. And we've had several crews of astronauts over the years uh, coming back to uh, upgrade the telescope and service it, keeping it in tip-top shape. So Hubble is in great shape. We're getting some of the best science out of it now than ever before in its history. We're learning not only about the atmospheres of some exoplanets, but we're also learning about star systems, other galaxies, even the whole universe, the history of the universe. And we anticipate getting good science from Hubble for quite a few years to come. In fact, we are hoping that we overlap with the James Webb Space Telescope, which will launch in 2021, and overlap with that telescope for several years because these complementary observatories are going to give us terrific science. They're going to cover the wavelength range of, of light from mid-infrared all the way through the visible colors that our eyes can see and on into the higher energy ultraviolet light. This gives us a great deal of information about whatever we're studying, whether it's exoplanets, or uh, planets, planets in our own solar system, mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course other stars and galaxies. And we complement other missions. You know, Hubble is being used to complement the information that we're getting from probes that we're sending within our own solar system. For example, the Juno probe studying Jupiter in our own solar system is sending back information that we're correlating with observations from Hubble. We're using, we've used it along uh, with New Horizons to study um, Pluto. We're using it with other missions to study things outside of our solar system and, and in, in the deep universe. So I think Hubble's in great shape and will be for quite a few years to come, and that makes me very happy. <laughs> that makes me very happy, but unfortunately, this is the end of the show. Um, if you want to know more about Hubble or about this ExoMoon, you can go to our website, nasa.gov slash Hubble. We've got a bunch of great new products up there. We've got an interactive timeline that you can uh, see Hubble milestones. You can check out a 360 tour of our Space Telescope Operations Control Room. You can see where all the action happens. And we've uploaded hours of Hubble historical video for you to check out. So head to nasa.gov slash Hubble, or you can find us on social media at NASA Hubble. And Thank you so much for joining us, and a very, very happy birthday to NASA.